Good afternoon and welcome to The Soul Shop. I am your host, Phyllis King. And today we're going to be taking a deep dive into anxiety and anxiousness. We all have it or we know someone or love someone who has it as well. And today my very special guest is Dr. Tracy Marks. She's a board certified general and forensic psychiatrist and she's been in this role for over 20 years. And her mission is to increase mental health awareness and understanding by educating people on psychiatric disorders, mental well-being, and self-improvement. Her website literally says mental health does not have to be a mystery. Well, if you've cracked the code on that one, you're going to be getting a Nobel Prize, I'm sure. <laughs> but I must say that you also have a YouTube channel with over a million followers. And so you're doing the work out there, boots on the ground. That's right. That is right. I am out there doing it and loving every minute of it. I really enjoy my YouTube channel. I can tell there's a lot of videos on your website, which is, I have to keep putting my glasses on, markpsychiatry.com. There's all kinds, of, it's stacked with information and tools. Now you're an um, author many times over, and today I'm sure we're going to dive into the, your most recent book, Why Am I So Anxious? That's yes. the question. Is yeah, there that more is... anxiety now than there used to be? Or are we just more aware of it? And I mean, my children are talking about this disorder and that disorder is what's happening. So I think it's a combination of both. I think there's a confluence of factors that's making us more anxious with the instability of the world. But then also there's just an increase in awareness mm -hmm. and understanding and a, a, an increased comfort level in even talking about this. I mean, when I was probably your children's age, um, you know, this was something you didn't talk about this out loud, talk mm -hmm. about anything mental. That's so true. I think things like TikTok and other social media uh, outlets have helped younger generations grow up being more comfortable talking about this and making them be more introspective to recognize their own symptoms. You know, I love it when my my daughter especially will say to me, my social anxiety, I'm like, okay, I didn't <laughs> know about that when I was a teenager or whatnot. Is there a line we're crossing where we're starting to make things up in our mind? Or is this just a dialogue that we're starting to get our arms around? So it is a double-edged sword. Information can be problematic or can be used um, non-constructively. So you know, I, on the one hand, I want people, I'm, I'm thrilled that people have a better understanding and are more comfortable talking about this and recognizing their own symptoms. But by the same token, self-diagnosis isn't the best thing either. So, um, you know, there are people who will avoid going to a doctor altogether because they've got it made up in their mind what they have because they Googled it or found it on the online. So, um, and, you know, I, I hear my, 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 um, I was going to say my husband, my son, well, that was a bad slip. My son, um, mentioned, um, I was telling him he should, he's, he has, he struggles with being social and social anxiety. And I said, you know, when you ask someone about themselves and then you offer something about you so they can feel connected. He says, well, if I talk about myself, then I'm being a narcissist. And I just hated hearing that. Because, um, you know, it's just, it's all over the web about narcissism. And then, it, you know, to just kind of flip it out there for, for everything is, is yeah. a mistake. Yeah. Well, and you're right about that. If you watch TikTok at all, everything's narcissism on there. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so before we dive into the gem and the wealth of your wisdom in the book and everything else, I'm always curious why psychiatry and why anxiety? What, why? What, what made you think this is a good path for me? Uh, you know, that's a great question because it was not my original path. My mm -hmm. original path was going to be, first of all, electrical engineering. That was my major in college. Um, but I realized I wanted to work more with people. And so I was going to do internal medicine. And that was what I was slated to do all the way up until my fourth mm -hmm. year of medical school. And I even matched in medicine, the match process is, is, um, you know, where you get assigned to a hospital that you're going to train at. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was, I was going internal medicine and it wasn't until I did my psychiatry rotation in my fourth year as a student that I realized, whoa, this is really this, this, um, 
vibes with me a whole lot more as far mm-hmm. as helping people with mental pain instead of tweaking their blood pressure medicines and things like that, which those things are important, Mm -hmm. but I fell in love with psychiatry in, in medical school, essentially. And this is, this is now 20 years ago, something like this. Uh, 20 plus (laughs) I'll stick with 20, but yeah, it's over 20 by this. I'm sure you have umpteen stories. Are there stories in the books, by the way? I know there's multiple books. I mean, we're talking about, uh, Uh, why am I so anxious right now? But are there stories or how's the book laid out? So there are stories in the book, some, many of which are my own stories about my own experience. And then there's hypothetical situations, which, you know, is based on my experience working with people. That's where I get the information from and the, and kind of the realism of those stories. But I didn't use any one particular patient. I just didn't, oh, I didn't okay. want to do that. Right, right. But, um, but yeah, there's, there's several stories in the book. Okay. Well, just curious. Okay. Well, let's, let's dive in. Okay. So um, what are our biggest misconceptions about anxiety? Do we all have it? Is it a disorder? What's the story? I think that, um, it, that I think that answer kind of goes in both directions or two directions. There's the camp of people who have a lot of anxiety, but don't recognize that that's actually what their problem is. Oh. And um, that can happen because it doesn't always look like what you think it should look like. We think of anxiety as maybe fearfulness or worry. Mm-hmm. And those are kind of the mm-hmm. typical ways you experience it. But mm-hmm. sometimes it can look like um, anger, mm-hmm. irritability. Mm-hmm. Um, excessive insecurity can be because you're anxious about presenting yourself or your own, or your own um, capabilities. So you become very withdrawn and um, can't make decisions, things like that. So that's kind of one group of people of, oh, I'm not anxious, but actually you are, it's just, Mm -hmm. you're just not seeing it that way. Mm -hmm. And then people, the, the other camp who maybe, um, downplays or, or minimizes um, their experience. Uh, that's kind of similar to the people who don't recognize it as real anxiety, but, uh, and the people who um, maybe turn it into or get very fearful of what they're experiencing as, as, oh, am I going crazy? There's something seriously wrong with me, or I'm flawed because something is stressing me out and they become anxious and they think that they're broken because of that. Is there a way that we can know when we actually have a disorder versus it's just momentary anxiousness? Yes. So there is, anxiety is one of those things we all experience it to some degree because it is an emotion and a reaction to things. And and it serves a a protective purpose as well um, at its most primitive level of making you react and uh, to threats. So uh-huh. um, our brains are wired to sense and and look for threats so that we can take note and run or what or fight whatever we decide to do. Um, so there's that, but reactionary anxiety you can think of as a an emotion or an experience you have that's temporary and it's manageable. And it's usually in, in relation to something that happened, a stressor, we would call it. So Mm -hmm. you have a big test coming up, you get anxious, you may have trouble sleeping the night before presentation or so, but once the stressor has passed, you come back to your usual state. So that would be normal reactionary anxiety, right? When it becomes more pathological, we would call it, that is when um, it causes more functional problems for you. So, and you do have trouble managing it and making yourself and, and coping, or maybe the coping mechanisms that you use have their own negative uh, outcomes, like mm-hmm. drinking too much to deal with your anxiety mm-hmm. or smoking or, or something else, overeating even. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of the things that can cause well, that we would look at as dysfunction from anxiety would be things like, how does your anxiety affect major areas of your life, your personal life? Are you having lots of fights with people you care about? Are you withdrawing from them and not interacting with them because you're so anxious? 
Uh, is it getting in the way of your work or schooling because you're not sleeping? You can't think. Some people can wake up every morning throwing up, things like that. So when it gets to the point where it starts interfering with your normal life functions and it's persistent, it's not just one night because you have a right, test, right. it's you know more days than not in a week, mm -hmm. that's when you start looking at, is this a disorder? I see. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And so I'm I'm sure you talk a lot about this in the book, ways we can approach managing ourselves, but is medication always a solution or, I mean, is, and is that a good thing in this holistic world and natural, this, that, and the other, um, is it a bad word to say medicate yourself or is that something we should be looking at? Or we have to talk to our practitioner, obviously, and go through processes, yeah. but what's your yeah, view so on that? <laughs> Right. So this isn't something you can just like Google it, find your diagnosis and then order your medicine. Okay. So you would have to get someone to prescribe this, right. especially over the, there are, there is over the counter stuff. And I talk about kind of natural uh, remedies in my um, book, but um, medication also is a double-edged sword, so to speak. And, you know, I prescribe them all the time because usually by the time someone comes to see me, a psychiatrist, they are expecting to take something to help their anxiety. And there are, there are people who can't really manage their anxiety without medication. The medication kind of turns down the dial on their anxiety, and that's what they need. Um, I've had some people come to me, say, you know, mid-30s or so, or mid-40s, and they're like, why did I wait so long? I could have been feeling this good years ago. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, medications do have a lot of side effects too. So some people can't tolerate them, mm -hmm. in which case um, more natural solutions are a better fit for mm -hmm. that kind of person. So it just really depends on the person, but not all anxiety, especially if it's situational, should, should um, require medications or you shouldn't always just look to take something for say, temporary situational anxiety. Mm -hmm. So are you currently seeing patients still? Or are you just a, an educator at this point? <laughs> mm. No, I have not evolved into the space of just educating. Okay. <laughs> um, as nice as that sounds. Uh, no, I, but I mean, I love seeing patients too. So I am mm -hmm. still seeing patients in my office. Mm -hmm. I am no longer taking new patients, oh. but I, I mm -hmm. see patients three to four days a week now. Is that in person or on Zoom or how does that work since you have to, if you're going to yeah. prescribe, I'd assume you'd need to have blood pressure and things like that. No, it is all remote for me. Oh, um, the exception okay. to that is I am a forensic psychiatrist as well, which is legal issues in psychiatry. So yeah. sometimes I need to do evaluations of people, mm -hmm. um, in which case I do go to my office for those. But hey, I've still got three years on my lease. <laughs> I should be there sometimes. But for everyone else, my patients that I treat, it's all remote. And before COVID, I did a little bit of remote um, it wasn't my thing per se, because I just felt like it was all about, you know, being in person. But once I got used to it after COVID, now mm -hmm. most people don't even want to have to drive to my office. It's true. And there's benefit um, to me seeing them in their own comfortable environment. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of value to that, that mm -hmm. I, I didn't have access to before. Yeah, interesting. Okay. All right. Um, so the, the forensic piece, I mean, I guess that brings in your engineering mind where you can really be specific about details, but why did that sound like a good idea going into court and trials and things like that? You know, I, you hit the nail on the head with the, with the connection to engineering, and that is exactly what that is about. Mm -hmm. So with forensic psychiatry, forensics is an application of psychiatry. So you take your basic understanding of uh, psychiatric disorders and how the mind works and whatnot and behavior and apply it to a legal situation. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what engineering is mm -hmm. or one aspect of it mm -hmm. is it's not just kind of memorizing facts it's taking formulas and things and then applying them to something mm -hmm. so i was already used to that kind of thinking and medicine and psychiatry is very problem solving and analytical more mm -hmm. than i think some other specialties not all but some so um 
forensics just took it to another level that way of analysis. Interesting. Well, it's fascinating how you've really pushed out on all of your talents and interests and made it work for you in your life. I guess there's a whole nother book about that. I know. And it just happened. It's not like I, I knew 20 years ago that this is where I would be. It just yeah. kind of evolved. Um, well, when I think about how much you know about this topic, um, and you are an educator uh, on your channel and now and with your books, do you see this getting pushed out into curriculum and in schools potentially? Because I know just with my kids' friends over the years, I mean, every, this there's just a these all these kids that are cutting these days, all these kids that are vaping and having relationships far too soon and getting off track and don't know who they are, their identity is up for who am I? I mean, it's like kind of a mess out there. And I'm, I'm thinking this is people not having enough tools to manage their system. That's my amateur hour analysis. But what do you think about pushing out into the schools? I would absolutely love that. In fact, I mean, I have a teenager and I see, I mean, I knew this because I was taught this, that the teenage years and things is very um, tumultuous. There, you know, a lot of identity issues and and just who am I and what's my place in this world and all that stuff and on hormonal changes and whatnot. And anxiety starts in the teen years, actually, um, in some for some even earlier than that. But long, but still, let me stay on track here. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I I knew it, but I also see it firsthand, and just my heart just just aches for that 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 period of their lives of just like a lot of not understanding things and and having to manage themselves. Mm -hmm. So I would love nothing more than to introduce some mental health education instead of the education only coming from TikTok. Right. <laughs> um, and that's yeah. nothing against TikTok. I have a TikTok right. Uh, right. profile, right. but still. Um, and I even tried to do that at my son's school. And, you know, I'm still trying to work with that, but there's all of, you know, there's still these issues, there's red tape and there's, you know, well, our, our students have to learn the approved curriculum. So I'd like, I'd love mm -hmm. for psychology, psychiatry, these kinds of things to be part of an, an approved curriculum for yeah. someone to be able, like me to be able to come in and teach. Well, let's hope, let's call that vision. I think that would be wonderful to have that happen. So um, you're going to give us the condensed version, I suppose, but what is um, too much, po why is too much positivity a problem? <laughs> too much positivity or kind of superficial fake positivity is a problem because it 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 makes you disavow or not accept your real feelings and 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 make you feel driven to um not process real feelings in favor of the more acceptable mm -hmm. positive feelings mm -hmm. so you know something happens something negative happens let's say i lose my job well, it was meant to be, you know, and, and not, and, and maybe it was meant to be, but mm -hmm. if that's your only response and every time someone asks you about it, it's, well, you know, it's, it's some, something out there is better for me. Have you really had a chance to, to recognize or appreciate the anger that you have? If you have it, you might not be angry, but any, was, are you angry at all that they let you go? Are you hurt or feel um, like people you weren't valued, you know, those kinds of things. If you just sweep all of that under the rug in favor of, well, it was all meant to be what, what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Then those yeah. feelings yeah. that you didn't deal with will come out in some other way mm -hmm. at a time where right. you really weren't wanting them to, right. um, you know, our mind doesn't forget what we're really thinking. Right. That's such an amazing point. Um, and this other, what is good girl syndrome? I, I didn't want to watch the video because I wanted to hear from your own lips what that is, but that sounds pretty juicy. <laughs> actually, that wasn't, um, that wasn't a video that actually was oh. just a, a, a blog post, oh, but, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm, but essentially it, it kind of is somewhat related to this toxic positivity, uh, issue, but it's, Again, being a people pleaser, um, not wanting, always feeling like you've got to um, 
look good. You can never be angry. Uh, everything's good. And you don't want to rustle any feathers because, because you're a good, a good girl or good okay. boy, whichever mm -hmm. the case may be. That's a lot of pressure. That's just a lot of pressure. That is a lot of pressure yeah. because then you can't really be yourself. Yes. So your book, uh, why am I so anxious? What are, what are we going to get in that book when we pick it up more of this and this insightful dialogue or what, what comes forward in the book? Um, so there's some of this that we've been talking about, um, but it's, it's really jam packed, uh, I've, I've found that the more I've talked about it, and then I go back and look how many things I actually have never talked with anyone about that's in the book, who's interviewed mm -hmm. me say, because it's just so much stuff in there. It's hard mm -hmm. to get into one or even two conversations, but mm -hmm. the first half of the book goes through various reasons you could be anxious. So okay. I talk about disorders, the difference between just normal anxiety versus a disorder, the different disorders. Um, and then different temperaments and personalities that can cause anxiety oh, okay. over parenting uh, can make children anxious. Helicopter. So, parenting, okay. Oh yes. And, um, <clears throat> and trauma. So I talk about all those things as reasons, existential mm -hmm. anxiety. I even have a, a, a little, not chapter, but a part of a chapter on that. And then in the second half of the book, I give you a bunch of tools or coping mechanisms or things to use for your anxiety. And I divide them up into mind tools mm. like meditation and mm. um, uh, affective labeling is one of the things where you assign um, words to your emotions. Mm -hmm. And then there's body tools. That would be things like yoga, breathing, mm. um, even I even talk about um, laughter yoga, uh, oh. which was an interesting thing. I've actually heard of that. Have you? Yes. Okay. Yes. I hadn't heard it. I actually yeah. discovered it as I was doing research for this. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and then I talk about behavior tools. Mm -hmm. Um, and something like that would be, um, exposure exercises. Mm -hmm. uh, so essentially is another way of saying facing your fears mm -hmm. a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So since you aren't currently taking new patients, I guess the YouTube channel is really the best way to, um, get your wisdom and the book, of course, you have more than one book, but this is the current one. Why am I so anxious? But is the YouTube channel the best place to get a hold of you? And, yes, I would yeah. say so. Um, I'm also on Instagram and that oh, okay. the content on there is a little bit different. Right. Um, I mean, it's, it, but so it's more kind of like bite-sized information on, on Instagram, but um, yeah, you know, the YouTube, YouTube helps me expand my reach, but it also helps me talk about more than I would even talk about in a patient mm -hmm. session. Right. Because one of the things that got me started with it is I did want to reach more people than just my patients, but yeah. I wanted to, I do therapy too. So I'd see someone and we, I wanted to talk about their relationships and things, but I don't want to go into a speech about explaining this and that and the other. So I could just say, Hey, go watch my video on this, that, and the other. Now we can talk mm -hmm. about you and your boyfriend. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the, the information that I talk about or what I talk about on my YouTube channel is actually goes beyond what I would be even doing in a session. And I'm like, you know, giving my best information. Um, and is it just your name, Dr. Tracy Marks or? Yes, it is Dr. Tracy Marks, D-R, and then Tracy with an E-Y, yes. and then Marks, M-A-R-K-S. Yes. And that's on Instagram as well as TikTok, same handle. And I'm not sure why it didn't happen, but I almost, I always read the books of my guests. I didn't get your book. So I would have read it had I, oh. <laughs> and then the interview came up and I'm, so I was a little bit at a disadvantage, but I, I saw some of it and I knew we would have a good conversation. Um, what else did I want to ask you? Um, what else do we, do the readers or viewers need to know that we haven't covered? I mean, is there an end to anxiety? I mean, do you have uh, stories or is there hope? I mean, are we just going to be forever at the whim of this challenge? So I would say that, and I, and I say this in the book similarly, that anxiety is like a wave that 
the ebbs and flows, it comes and goes. Um, even, and I'll, I'll give the same speech to my patients who are getting treatment, let's say medication treatment for anxiety. Anxiety will never, you will never have zero anxiety. No one will because of the fact that it is also a response to life or external stressors. So um, what the best that we can hope for is that whatever anxiety we experience is manageable and, and, and it passes. Mm -hmm. And even if you have an anxiety disorder where it goes above and beyond just the normal anxious response, even with that disorder, it can come and go in waves. So it, you can go through a phase of your life or a chapter where it's not that bad. You know, you have some bad days here and there. And then another chapter of, or phase of your life where it's unmanageable and most days are very unpleasant. Interesting. Those are the days when, when I'm treating someone, say with medication, um, those are the, the times that either they may need more medication or adjustment, or they have to pull in more tools. So I think the ideal scenario for someone who has a disorder and is taking medication is that say they, they get on medication, you turn down the dial of their anxiety, and then they work in these, these behavioral tools or these things that they can do to manage their anxiety. And not everything works for everyone for every scenario either. And that's in my, in the appendix of my book, I give different scenarios and say, these are tools that are good for this. This is what's good for that cool. to make it easier to figure out what to do when, Excellent. but like get your, get your own little group of things that work for you and figure out what those are so that when the wave crests or peaks, you can start doing those things and get your anxiety under control. And then maybe at some point, not even need medication anymore mm. because you know what to do mm. when, when you need to do it. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. That gives me a lot of hope. So the book is Why Am I So Anxious? It's Dr. Tracy Marks. Thank you so much for being here today. It's been fascinating. Yes, this was a delight. I really enjoyed this.